Welcome to COIQ, a first of its kind video program about health innovators, early adopters, and influencers, and their stories about riding the roller coaster of healthcare innovation. I'm your host, Dr. Roxy, founder of Legacy DNA Marketing Group, and it's time to raise our COIQ. Welcome back, COIQ listeners. On today's show, we're digging into product co-creation and adoption strategies with David Goldsmith from WeGo Health. David, welcome to the show. Thank you, Roxy. It's great to be with you. So before we get into the meat of this discussion, uh, go ahead for our audience and tell them a little bit about your background and what you do. Sure. Well, I'm currently the Chief Strategy Officer for WeGo Health, and I've been working in digital health for about 10 years now. I uh, have been really spent my entire career working in technology, and most of that was focused on building social networks to connect people in special interest areas. But I shifted to a focus on health after my wife was diagnosed with cancer and got an up-close view of the healthcare system and was frankly a little stunned to see how dysfunctional uh, it was. And it inspired me to try to be involved and bring my background and interest to bear in healthcare. So ever since I've been working uh, with a number of companies trying to bring new technologies to market to hopefully improve the patient experience as well as outcomes. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So, so what is it like for you riding this crazy roller coaster of healthcare innovation? It depends on which day you ask me, I'll admit, yeah. but um, <clears throat> you know, I will say that it's incredibly exciting in most, on most days and mm -hmm. And other days, it's, it's daunting, right? Because if you've ever attend, attended the HIMSS conference, which I believe you have, you see in the numerous ex, exhibition halls how big and monstrous and powerful these incumbent companies are in healthcare. And they control a lot of different dimensions of the healthcare mm -hmm. system. So since I've been mostly focused on startup um, working with startup companies uh, that are trying to gain traction somewhere within this incredibly complex ecosystem, it, it's just daunting, right? How do you compete with companies? Um, how do you partner with them? How do you cut through the noise and the hype? And the, you know, the challenges never go away. The flip side is when you do start to get traction, it's so gratifying because of the nature of the work and what we're trying to accomplish. Mm -hmm. uh, it just makes it worth it. And I will say that um, I've never regretted the day I got into healthcare and tech, and I can't imagine actually not working at this point within the healthcare system. And that's despite working almost every day with you know, very large life sciences and pharmaceutical companies who <laughs> By any measure can pose some substantial challenges to, to getting things done, but we're making great headway. Awesome. That's great. So um, I know that you all talk a lot about this term called patient leader. So for our audience, help us understand what do you mean when you say patient leader? So when we look at the community of patients who are actively engaged online, one of the things that we have noticed over many years now is that there is a segment of those patients who really start to be um, highly visible because of how, not just how active they are online, but how many followers they have, how, uh, how, um, what the, their, the nature of their participation is. So for example, many of them have created blogs and are very active bloggers. Some have established a substantial digital footprint on Facebook or Twitter, um, and now Instagram as well. And even many have set up YouTube channels. Mm -hmm. So you start to see people who are deeply engaged in their own health, but they're also very active in trying to help other people uh, with similar conditions or the same conditions navigate various aspects of their health and the decisions they're making day to day about aspects of their health care. And so we just started uh, many, many years ago um, trying to do a better job of finding these people, connecting with them, and, 
and looking at the role they're playing. And it became very clear to us that there is a growing number of people out there who can, who are, of course, uh, patient advocates. They're people who are helping others. Um, they're um, sharing a lot of information. They're connecting their peers um, to vital resources and so forth. And they're playing a very valuable advocacy role. And within that, there are also people who are clearly influencer, influencers, mm -hmm. right? These are people who are <clears throat> primarily through social media, actually measurably influencing how other people are um, managing their care or making certain decisions about things to look into, whether that's a new treatment option or a new medication or something along those lines. Uh, and we also know that there are people who are clearly thought leaders within this community. Those are the people you often see on the main stage now mm -hmm. at conferences, sharing their experience and bringing the patient voice into conferences. So when we talk about patient leaders, we're really talking about the, the opinion leaders and the health influencers who are not only viewable and findable by virtue of their substantial digital footprint, but also by virtue of uh, what we're seeing from their peers who on an annual basis when we run our awards program, um, step up in a big way to both nominate these pay people and, mm -hmm. and different categories or um, to vote for them once they're actually nominated. And we get tens of thousands of people in patient communities uh, validating that these are the leaders within the patient community they look to um, to stay connected, to get support, and to learn about new ways of, of you know, essentially coping with or managing their health. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So why, why is it important, you know, majority of our listeners are health innovators, early adopters. So why is it important for health innovators who maybe are um, bringing new products, new innovations to market, why is it important for them to involve patients or patient leaders in the uh, product co-creation process? Well, it's important because ultimately, if you are hoping or expecting patients to adopt whatever solution you're bringing to market, then you are wise to work with them to understand whether what you're introducing to the market is in fact going to meet their needs mm -hmm. and be usable and useful. I mean, I know that goes without saying, but I think the <clears throat> landscape of failed products and solutions targeting patients is, you know, it's kind of vast, right? I mean, we see it Definitely. pretty much on a daily basis where uh, new apps, new devices, um, new wearables, uh, and so forth are brought to market with with very good intentions of solving real patient problems, but for a host of reasons, they just don't get adoption. So we often learn that part of the failure there was a disconnect between what the entrepreneurs and the innovators thought was necessary or what would they thought might be addressing mm -hmm. the problems and what the patients themselves <laughs> see as uh, critical f for them. And they, there's an opportunity by virtue of working with uh, patient thought leaders and influencers and advocates early on in the development design process to really better understand, is this something that um, we can validate uh, through your experience and your own you know, use, user feedback is in fact going to meet your needs? So it's not unlike the kind of design thinking process that we see uh, in many other industries where that kind of involvement early on can really make a difference down the road in terms of mm -hmm. adoption. So it's the reason why increasingly we are working with a pretty diverse range of, of pharmaceutical companies and even others now to uh, bring patients in early for qualitative insights to better understand for example, what does that patient journey look like, particularly if you're dealing with uh, a chronic or complex or rare condition? And um, 
you know, you can't find a substitute for when it comes to design thinking, you simply can't find a substitute for the end users of your intended product. So um, that's vital. And then I will add that one of the other things now that we believe is really proving to be very promising is working with patient influencers and leaders who do have uh, a lot of followers in social media to help build awareness of your solutions once they're on the market. Now, that is a little easier if what you're talking about is a device or a product or something that is um, kind of a direct to consumer solution. When it's through a B2B channel like a provider or a payer or potentially even a pharmaceutical company, that can be a little bit trickier and yet um, we still see opportunities to work with these individuals um, to think very strategically and um, also tactically about mm -hmm. what can be done to try to really raise awareness within patient communities that these kinds of solutions exist, um, how they work, why they, would, why they are beneficial, um, and working you know, with that, the, the patients themselves to help get that word out. Um, because we know that, again, from our own research, that if they're sharing that kind of information, uh, the likelihood of other patients acting on it is far greater than if that same message is being delivered by a, a company itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, kind of um, staying with the product co-creation, there's a framework that we use with clients. We call it the five co's because, you know, it's not just the actual um, like you might think of like, hey, at the end, I created this product, you know, the validation, the co-validation of what do you think about it? But I love what you're saying because it's really about involving the patients much earlier in that uh, product development or commercialization process. So how, how do you recommend that health innovators engage patients around ideation, valuation, um, development, all these different stages of the product co-creation process? How does a health innovator um, find, and this is going to sound like it is a absolute direct promotion for, for your company. Um, I just think that the work that you guys are doing is, is really important and it's something for health innovators to be aware of and then understand how to take advantage of. So help us or help the audience um, understand how do they get patients involved in this process? You know, it's a very good question. And I will say that one of the barriers to this that we've encountered over the years by virtue of you know, talking to lots of companies about this, this kind of thing is that they often simply don't know where to find the right people to bring into the room. Mm -hmm. it, that's, it's not a slam dunk. I, I have, by any means, right? And, mm -hmm. and sometimes it's um, not knowing um, who to draw in and what they can really contribute. Sometimes there's trepidation because they're not sure whether what they're going to learn is, is, uh, is going to provide them with sort of actionable information or insight. Um, there are sometimes questions depending on the nature of the company or, or if, for example, with providers. Sometimes there's real uh, concerns around confidentiality, confidentiality or privacy and not wanting to have any appearance of uh, stepping into a conversation with a patient by, because they know that they have a certain condition. So they kind of want to create a, a, a sort of firewall there, if you will. Yep. But, um, you know, the, the thing that is, um, you know, I think important to keep in mind is that it's, it, goes with, it kind of goes without saying that the patient population is not a monolith, right? Within any uh, I mean, all of us know people sometimes in our family, certainly friends who are incredibly engaged, very knowledgeable, and uh, the kind of people who you want to bring into a room to have a conversation, um, generally, not to mention one that is very well informed when it comes to trying to understand how to um, create a, a product or a solution that will be well received by people who have who are affected by a certain condition mm -hmm. so 
Um, but you know, just casting a broad net isn't always a very efficient way to go about it. And it is one of the reasons why um, you have companies, you know, like WeGo Health and others that are trying to do a better job, frankly, of vetting and curating the patient communities that are out there to find those people who um, can come in on day one and mm -hmm. really add value to your conversation. And so, um, you know, the important thing I believe is to really consider starting with something along the lines of a patient advisory board. You know, Roxanne, I mean, one, of, one of the things that I'm struck by with so many startup companies, and, and I've been perfectly guilty of this myself in, in my career, we're very quick to want to put together some kind of ad advisory board um, that has technologists, for example, or mm -hmm. certainly in the case of healthcare, uh, people with you know, very strong clinical backgrounds. And that's with good reason, right? Those are, the, those are key stakeholders. These are the people who know the industry well. It makes perfect sense to have that kind of expertise involved in your enterprise. But it's kind of remarkable if your company is really trying to bring to market a solution that will be adopted by patients, whether that's to reduce cost and utilization, whether it's ultimately to improve outcomes, medication adherence, you know, whatever it may be, it's, it's a little odd that we don't see more companies create an advisory board that consists of the people that they ultimately are trying to reach. So we, mm -hmm. we, we think that's a really good starting point. Um, that's a because, really good point. You know, mm -hmm. and now again, that still begs the question <clears throat> you asked, which is, okay, well, who do we bring in for our advisory board? And, um, you know, depending on your, uh, on, your, on your product or your service and the nature of the condition that you work, conditions that you're working in, mm -hmm. um, you know, there are a lot of factors to consider in terms of what's the right representation mm -hmm. um, to bring to the table. We've actually certainly had many uh, companies say to us, okay, we understand we go healthy. You can bring the advocates and the influencers and the thought leaders, but those people aren't representative of our target population. Um, for example, we, you know, if, if you are targeting um, a, a, a you know, segment of the population that's very, very difficult to reach, um, you know, where the barriers to access have been um, kind of abnormally high, right, in healthcare, <clears throat> low income populations, people in transportation deserts, mm -hmm. there are lots of examples there, you know, how, you know, don't we need to have those folks at the table as well, because they are, you know, representative of our population. So um, that is important. And, you know, what we're finding is that in some cases, the people we work with are ideally suited to something like a patient advisory board. In other cases, they're also, they, because they are so connected in patient communities, they're incredibly adept at helping, helping us and our clients find other people who would be mm. really well suited to an advisory board, in part because perhaps they are more representative mm -hmm. of the patient population. And I think, you know, one um, thing that is just always striking to me, even after having been in the business as long as I have, and especially just in social networking and social media, is that you know, as we're having this conversation today, there are literally tens of thousands of patients online right now on all these different um, platforms having conversations about various aspects of healthcare. Mm -hmm. um, some may be newly diagnosed and in the early stages of, um, of, of a crisis that they now need to navigate. Um, people, for example, who are newly diagnosed with cancer are often quick to go online, to go to support groups um, and try to connect with other people um, who have been in their shoes and try to, to get support there. There are people who are on the opposite end of that spectrum, you know, 20 year cancer survivors, for example, who are still very active and providing peer support online. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, just countless kinds of um, 
uh, representatives of this patient community. And if you can um, connect with the leaders within some of these patient communities, they can be a great source to help you find people who perhaps would be very um, appropriate to bring onto an advisory board um, and are happy to help do that. So knowing that you work in this environment, give us an example of how involving a patient in the co-creation process can help uncover, um, you know, hidden insights for them. How it can uncover? The yeah. So, you know, I'm, I'm assuming that with all the different um, people that you've s selected, worked with, and placed, um, you know, is there an example that you can share with our listeners to say this is um, maybe some assumptions that the health innovator had beforehand and they put together a patient advisory board or um, involved the patient in the co-creation process and this was some of the aha moments they had or something that they uncovered that they really didn't see on their own? Sure. Let me uh, give you one example that I think is, is, is a pretty telling one. It actually... Uh, was a um, project that was spearheaded by folks on the human-centered design team at Partners Healthcare in Boston. They were assigned the task of putting together an advisory board to help some clinicians there uh, create a new, figure out essentially a, some kind of new s solution to support people with epilepsy. Mm -hmm. And um, they came into that conversation with, with a bit of a blank slate, right? They really wanted to understand what the needs are. They had their own opinions by virtue of working with people with epilepsy and were making certain assumptions as they, as, as, as you would expect based on the clinical care they provide. Um, but they also felt like there were unrecognized um, needs that perhaps weren't being addressed. Mm -hmm. So they put together and again, by virtue of, of the skill set um, of the folks who were involved on that team, they they came into that with a design thinking um, sort of framework, right? Which meant get the right stakeholders in the room in front of a whiteboard and start to really work through those assumptions and work through key questions about where those needs are, what the hospital could be doing differently, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And so they, they did the right thing. They not only brought in um, clinicians. Uh, they also brought in, uh, I believe, a, a payer. Uh, they brought somebody in from a national advocacy organization. They brought in a patient leader uh, with epilepsy who is very active in, again, online communities, right? Mm -hmm. Connecting with lots of people. So she's, she was a great um, sort of barometer for where the needs are in the community. She has her eyes and her ears to the ground um, just by virtue of participating in these communities. So um, when she came into those meetings, she was not only again able to speak to her own experience as a person with epilepsy, but she was able to talk about what she was seeing online, what mm -hmm. challenges people were surfacing, um, what pain points they were talking about, where they were looking for support, et cetera. And um, in that process of identifying where the needs were, unmet needs in particular, uh, the clinicians in the room had identified a whole host of things that they thought um, th that they were seeing, uh, but it really wasn't, um, uh, f there was a main problem that was flagged uh, by the patient advocate herself, which hadn't even really been on the radar, and it was in fact transportation issues. And the um, problem that people who have had um, an epilepsy seizure often face, which is that they lose their license um, and they lose driving privileges for a period of time um, by virtue of their seizure, or they're simply anxious about driving for obvious reasons. Sure. So it's not a classic example of, a, of a, tr a kind of transportation desert issue that we do see in a lot of communities. It was more a very um, you, you know, kind of use case condition specific example where um, these are people who often are isolated and end up not making it to their appointments um, and, and, you know, uh, for whatever reason, don't feel like there's a, an easy solution for them sometimes at the spur of the moment. So they 
essentially were um, uh, in that process able to work with a patient leader who flagged something, surfaced something for them that simply hadn't been recognized. Um, and it kind of steered them away from thinking about uh, this in kind of more high tech, uh, so to speak, ways. I mean, they've, I guess, been very um, interested in looking at perhaps bringing in a new app to market that people with epilepsy could use or something else. And it turns out that, that this issue, if, if it could be addressed, in a, in a very um, direct way would actually be viewed by, the, by those patients as incredibly helpful and, and solve a very real problem. Yeah, and I, I think that there's many times where there, those things are overlooked unless you're involving the stakeholders, the right stakeholders in that process, absolutely. So let's kind of just flip the coin again, because, you know, just because on the other side of this, just because you have a patient involved in the process doesn't mean that you're going to automatically reach commercial success. There are definitely some pitfalls just to be mindful of. I, I, I kind of refer to them as guardrails to have in place um, whenever you're involving patients or really any stakeholder group in the product co-creation process. Um, is, is there anything that you've stumbled upon um, of, of just kind of something that could be a pitfall of in, including them? Well, I, I, it's, it's, a, it's a good question. I, I, I think, um, you know, I'll tell you that, you know, one, one pitfall is that there is a risk that if you have engaged one or several patients, like, for example, in an advisory board, um, with the intent of listening to them and using their um, insights and feedback to guide your roadmap. Mm -hmm. And at the end of that process, you, for whatever reason, and it may be for, a you know, for, for good uh, business reasons, uh, you choose to essentially ignore or, dis or kind of, in a sense, dismiss what was, uh, you know, what was put forth in that advice among the folks on that advisory board, there, there, there's some risk of backlash there unless they are clear on, on the basis for your decision. I mean, or your, th or if they understand your thinking, I mean, th there are plenty of examples that we've heard of mostly, mostly anecdotal, um, mm -hmm. where, where, um, people feel the patients who are brought into some of these kinds of, um, ad boards or, or, or panels where they're asked to share their, their insights uh, and perspective. Uh, they feel like they've shared a lot of information, but they don't see it really go anywhere. It doesn't mm -hmm. manifest itself in any obvious way in terms of the future course or, or the future path that organization takes. So um, while you may start the process out with a in with a real um, with good intentions and a spirit of goodwill, mm -hmm. uh, it ends up in some cases um, looking like uh, you were essentially paying lip service uh, to those individuals and not really intending to take their advice, but ultimately to be able to say at the end of the day, you listened to them. Right. Right. right? Yeah. So, um, and and again, <laughs> there may be perfectly um, logical, defensible reasons for not necessarily moving forward with whatever recommendations um, or or advice uh, an ad board like that put on the table, uh, but if they haven't been brought along with your process after, let's say you've convened that meeting uh, or several meetings, um, and don't know why you ended up where you did. Um, then, you know, there can be some backlash there. Sure. Yep. The, the other thing that um, is, a, is a pitfall, and it, we hear this um, certainly from companies that are, where there's if kind of trepidation about working with patient uh, leaders, is the, um, the concern is that patient advocates in particular can simply be very difficult to work with. Um, because they come in with a real, um, some very strongly held views on, on how the system has failed them or where the shortcomings are 
um, in, in various aspects of their of their healthcare experience. And those people can be, um, you know, strident. They can be agitators. In some mm -hmm. cases, they've been deeply affected by what has transpired, which sure. is partly why they are now advocates, right? Sometimes mm -hmm. they, for example, like you know, in the serious cases, they've they've had their own issue with. Um, a, you know, a surgical procedure gone wrong, a medical device that turned out to have been unsafe. I mean, you know, there's a litany of issues out there. And it's entirely possible that in some cases, people with those experiences um, will come in and use these opportunities to vent at great length and quite adamantly. And then people feel like, you know, we hear you, we understand this, but that's not really why we invited you here. And it's not right, going right. to help us solve the problem. <laughs> yeah. um, so that's where, again, there's trepidation, sometimes some real ambivalence, and it is, again, erected as a barrier to, to, to working with patients because of that fear. And it's a reason why we believe part of our role at We Go Health is to do vetting in order to, I, you know, to try to find people who, it's not that they won't be passionate um, and, and have some strongly held views, but they will um, be clear coming into those kinds of, of, of meetings or playing those roles, mm -hmm. of what the expectations are and prepared to be a very constructive, um, you know, participant trying to help solve problems as opposed to just seeing it as an opportunity to vent some spleen. Yeah. And I, I think that it's important to acknowledge that and, and then, you know, that doesn't, um, that doesn't prevent us from engaging those patient leaders. It just helps us form the relationship and manage those expectations, communicate that up front, like, you know, like I said, guardrails for the engagement, for the relationship. One of the other things that I see that seems to be common too is, um, you know, listening to one or two people and then creating your solution around those specific things mm -hmm. and then realizing that it wasn't something that was viable for the entire marketplace. It, it would, they would buy it, um, but not necessarily something that would lead to, you know, true commercial success. So I, I, I think just acknowledging that there can be some challenges and then working in strategies of overcoming them is very valuable. So I want to switch gears a little bit and, and make sure that with the last few minutes that we have that we're also talking about the product adoption and engagement. And you touched on this a little bit earlier, um, but you know, Adoption and engagement is so difficult. I mean, you, you said it yeah. earlier, time and time again, we hear um, of, you know, the, the 2000 apps that um, no one's using, right? Um, <laughs> and for, for whatever reason, that would be, um, you know, just because it's a solution that solves a problem doesn't mean that it's going to reach commercial success. So um, what does a health innovator need to do to get patients to use their solution? Well, you know, the thing that we believe is encouraging from what we're seeing is that if you can identify patients who are using a mm -hmm. service or a product, an app, whatever it may be, with real success, um, and it's clear that it is having the intended effect, right, that, yeah. that someone is now um, in, a, in a better place in terms of their health or their patient experience by virtue of using your solution. That, that those are the people who really can be incredibly useful, helpful, committed ambassadors. Um, you know, it's the notion of patient ambassadors is, you know, in pharmaceutical industry in particular is kind of well, well established. It's, mm -hmm. it's, uh, and there are provider systems now that are uh, starting to build out patient ambassador programs so that they have patients who've had a very successful outcome and a great patient experience out there in their communities talking about um, why patients in those communities ought to go seek care in those areas. So we, yep. we know that there is a greater recognition that the a voice of a happy, satisfied patient um, is incredibly valuable. And... Um, so in terms of adoption, what we're seeing now is that 
in the process that we go through to on un, sort of unearth some of these really important insights in those in that early phase of, of a design process um, we can also learn well, what what is it that is as you think about messaging and communication within patient communities what is likely to resonate mm -hmm. right and um, we're now working with more and more patients in what we call our content studio, specifically to ha have them co-create the content or, and the creative assets that a company is going to use to help, connect, to help them connect with their target market on the patient side. So and you don't hear that very often. That's no, you great. don't. <laughs> and it, I mean, and when you look at that, you know, the primary industry we work in, which is the pharmaceutical industry, as we know, especially in most DTC campaigns, the people who are talking about their condition on commercials are actors and models. Mm -hmm. And those voices simply do not resonate. There's research that shows that. And in fact, especially with complex chronic conditions that are very challenging to manage, there's a resentment factor that a lot of pa patients will articulate because they see these actors who, who who simply aren't at all representative of the patient population. Running along the beach. Exactly. <laughs> yes, we see it, we, and we see it every day. And and you know, increasingly, of course, not surprisingly, those those drugs that are being promoted through those channels are often. Uh, you know, big molecule, specialty kind of drugs dealing with very, you know, challenging health conditions. Mm -hmm. So, um, so those people will talk about, I mean, a lot of those patients will talk quite freely about how they really are turned off by those messages. So we're trying to kind of what we say, flip the script yep. right? and work with the patients themselves to create the messaging that is likely going to be heard um, by their fellow patients. And we're not only taking it, but we're not stopping there. We're then, and I think this is, there's a lesson you know, to learned here for, for the innovators, not only work with them to shape the content, but where possible, work with them to, to get that message out through their channels. So um, you know, this is again, kind of an extension of a sort of ambassador slash influencer uh, model where people who are you know, hyper-connected through all these different social media platforms um, can say, look, I had a great experience with um, this CGM device. I've had a great experience with this CPAP machine, whatever it may be, and here's mm -hmm. why. Um, those are folks who you want to enlist um, as your allies to get the word out. So that's kind of, early adop that's kind of the early adoption curve where mm -hmm. we've spent most of our time working with companies, but I just want to point out that I do believe there's an opportunity to extend that model further down the, um, down the road or, or kind of integrate it more into the sort of care continuum, if you will, because uh, you know, a great example here in my backyard with a major provider was that they wanted to get a bunch of cardiac patients using an app when they went home to better manage their symptoms mm -hmm. um, and um, have some resources in the event that they were thinking they might need to get back into the ED. And they didn't talk to cardiac patients when they designed that app, and they didn't have very much success getting it utilized once it was on the market. And so it, there was a clear opportunity for them to actually work with cardiac patients to be in touch with other patients when they went home from the hospital to say, hey, you know, I just, I, I survived this as well. I know what you're going through. I understand your pain, your anxiety, et cetera. And here's an app I've been using provided by this hospital system. Here's why I think you should use it. If you have questions, we can help you. If you have, you know, you need technical support, we can help you. But having that message delivered by someone who, again, who's, who's been in their shoes is, is, is quite likely going to have a greater impact on that individual's willingness to work, use that app um, 
th than, than anybody else in the system. I'm a big believer. I, I mean, I, I think that it's just a no brainer. Why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you ask the people that you are expecting to use your solution um, to help co-market, co you know, co-launch and, and make them um, a part of that process? And so, it, you know, it sounds, David, like what you're talking about is that our listeners, health innovators, have the opportunity to include patients from end to end, the beginning I have an idea, what do you think? All the way to, I launched in, in each place in that continuum, all the way to, I launched it and now help me continue to promote it and to increase adoption and engagement. That's exactly. fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. So, so as we wrap up here, what advice, this is our last question, what advice do you have for health innovators um, who are in the trenches today? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, my advice is uh, to keep your eye on the prize at the risk of, um, of cliche, using a cliche. Yep. Um, and to be um, tenacious, of course, because without that, you likely will not survive, um, you know, the healthcare uh, marketplace. Um, I certainly, as you would expect, advise people to find patients to work with and get advice from. And, uh, and then I would say, try to be very open to the, to the um, prospect of having to um, you know, pivot, not just based on what you may be learning from your mm -hmm. target market, in this case, let's say patients, um, but by virtue of trying to bring a new product or a solution to market or get significant market traction in an ecosystem as you know, complex and um, some would say even rigged <laughs> as it is. I don't like to use that word, but that's but, another show. <laughs> that's a whole other episode. <laughs> you know, you got to be prepared to um, really roll with the punches and make some significant shifts in your plans based on where you see that friction, because it's pretty hard to break through it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to share your wisdom with our guests, um, you, with Rachel. our audience. I, I know that they, our listeners are going to get a lot of wisdom, um, a lot of thank good you. strategies and, and considerations from you today. So how can our audience get a hold of you if they've got any other questions about um, integrating patient leaders into their um, commercialization process? Well, if they're on Twitter, they can find me at DS Gold. That's my Twitter handle, and I'm certainly active there. DM me. It's an easy way to connect. Or okay. david.goldsmith at wegohealth.com. Um, I'm happy to have a conversation and um, just try to steer people in the right direction, provide whatever advice or guidance I can. Wonderful. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you very much. What's the difference between launching and commercializing a healthcare innovation? Many people will launch a new product, few will commercialize it. To learn the difference between launch and commercialization and to watch past episodes of the show, head to our video show page at drroxy.com. Thanks so much for watching and listening to the show. You can subscribe to the latest episodes on your favorite podcast app, like Apple Podcasts and Spotify, or subscribe to the video episodes on our YouTube channel. No matter the platform, just search COIQ with Dr. Roxy. Until next time, let's raise our COIQ.